Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Martin Ketting. I, I own a company called Rat River Technologies, and we specialize in um, wireless communications, focusing primarily on anything Wi-Fi all the way through licensed microwave. Um, we do a lot of internet, we do a lot of um, building to building communications, and we've moved more and more into video, sending uh, video over wireless. Um, I also have a uh, strong interest in vMix and video streaming, etc. So I thought I would do a two-part series on video over TCP IP. It's a topic that is um, a lot of people have questions over, and as we are moving into doing more and more video uh, communications over TCP IP, Ethernet, etc., there's a lot of questions about how does it work, what the problems are, and some people are finding that it's uh, they're having really good results, and other people are having a lot of problems. And um, there are a lot of challenges with moving into this new new world, <laughs> video over uh, TCP/IP. So I thought I would just share some thoughts um, with you. Um, just as a start, this is by no means an ex uh, an exhaustive um, uh, video on this topic. It's a really big topic. We could spend a week or two just talking about this, but this is just a overview. Hopefully it'll give you some ideas of, one of some of the things that you need to watch, some of the things that are challenges, and um, how to get around some of those. So I'm just going to bring up uh, a couple of slides here. So first of all, um, the first topic that uh, is for today's show um, is, is uh, SDI, HDMI, and NDI. Our second part in this series is going to be doing video over uh, wireless um, Wi-Fi and other types of communications. So the first part is um, should be very familiar to many of you. Um, we're all using SDI HDMI connections. Um, this slide just shows you a typical setup where you've got a uh, computer system, in this case running vMix, but it could be um, anything. It could be a TriCaster or it could be a switcher. Um, connected to the internet, uh, through a router, and we're streaming to a variety of different uh, different sources. Now, in that computer, we would have a couple of capture cards uh, connected with a PCI bus, so they are directly connected into the computer. And we've got uh, an example here of a card that is uh, four ports of SDI and four ports of HDMI. If we had SDI cameras, we would plug them directly into the SDI ports, and if we had HDMI cameras, we would plug them directly into the HDMI capture card. That's something that everyone does here. Um, the main thing I just want to emphasize here, though, is, is that this is a point-to-point -point communications um, setup. Every single camera has one single cable going to a port on the card. They're not competing for data with the other camera. Um, the only contention or the only um, issues that you would face with latency or processing or anything else would be either on the quality of the card, the speed of the card, or with the computer. And nowadays with the speed that we have in our computer systems and the cards that we have, this is very, very low latency. The signals come in and you lose a fractional a couple, maybe one or two frames um, to get it into your system and, and, and get it into the system. So um, very, very fast, very, re very efficient. But as we move into, um, um, into NDI, we need to know what the, um, the issues are. So first of all, just to, again, as a refresher with SDI and HDMI, um, SDI is a very durable card or very durable cable comes with BNC locking connectors. Uh, it's a coax shielded cable. Um, it's used widely in the video, assist video industry and for a long time. Um, we even did analog over coax. You can do, it's just a cable, so it doesn't really matter what you send over it. In fact, you can send Ethernet signals over it. Um, if you have a service with a cable TV provider, you get your cable TV, you get your internet, you get your voice, etc., all going over coax. So it's a very versatile cable. Um, limit is about 100 meters in, a, in this type of setup, about 328 feet. HDMI, on the other hand, is really from the computer industry, and um, it, the, the reason, of course, is because they needed something that would match up a computer board and monitor, etc. So they chose something called HDMI. Um, it used to be VGA in the analog format, then it went, um, and then it eventually went to HDMI. 
Um, the problems are that it's limited to about 15 meters or about 50 feet. Um, and depending on the quality of the cable, that might actually be less. If you have poor quality cable, you might even get 10, 20 feet out of it. Um, you can have a lot of issues with cable length and quality of cable in HDMI. The other thing is that there's no locking connector. Um, you plug it in and if it becomes loose, somebody trips on it, it's gonna pull out, or if it just gets loose, sometimes you lose the signal just because it's not in properly. Um, so there are some issues definitely associated with H HDMI, but, SDI systems are typically much more expensive. They're more in the um, professional series cameras and, and equipment, whereas HDMI is really a consumer or prosumer um, level cable, and therefore the costs are much lower. Now, when we get into going over uh, TCP IP, we're going to go to something uh, called uh, NDI. Um, so this looks the same. We've got our computer system and we are connected to uh, streaming, but in this case we're actually going through a switch system. It might be one or more switches and you may already be plugged into a switch first before you go to your router in the other slide, um, but this is how it would work. Your computer would be connected to your switch via Ethernet cable. Typically it could be fiber if, uh, if you so choose, but for this, for this series of slides we're just going to be talking specifically about Ethernet. Um, then if we wanted to take our, um, our older cameras, our SDI and HDMI cables, we would need some kind of converter to NDI. So in this case I'm using uh, the picture here is a, a bird dog, which is a brand new product. It converts HDMI and SDI to um, NDI and sends it over Ethernet. So in this case we would have our camera, um, our SDI camera, and if we wanted to have an HDMI camera, uh, we could do that as well. There are a number of cameras that are coming out on the market right now that actually have NDI built in. So um, uh, PTZ Optics, for example, has a pan tilt zoom camera that's NDI just coming on the market. Uh, New Tech has got one. There's, there's going to be more and more of these, and they plug in directly into your switch or switches. That's the nice part about Ethernet is that you can plug into a switch on the other side of the building, run a cable from that switch to this switch, which plugs into your vMix system, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, so there's an incredible amount of versatility in, um, in Ethernet cabling and fiber cabling, etc. However, when we start uh, thinking about it, there is also some real problems, um, or potentially problems. One of them is that TCP IP is really a multi-user system. So in that switch, you might have one, two, 10, 20 computers um, and other devices, printers, scanners, cameras, you name it, plugged into that switch. And TCP, TCP IP is designed for multi-use. It really is focused on, um, on this. Um, so we're just going to... Um, Go back here. So let's let's uh, talk about some of the challenges. So um, TCP/IP was designed originally by the military. It was designed to be a resilient system. So if you were in a city and you wanted to send a signal to uh, across the country, that signal would go out of your system. It would go through a number of devices called routers, and you really didn't care how it got to the other end. It might go through one, two, five different devices and eventually it would arrive at the destination. If for whatever the path changed, one of those devices went down, it would just reroute to a different uh, path and that's why they're called rotors. Um, that's how TCP IP worked. And in fact, if that signal came in out of order at the other end, it would be reassembled. If some of that message was corrupted and it never made it through, the system would automatically send back a message to the host and say, hey, can you please retransmit that because I didn't get everything. And the host would retransmit it and then the uh, receiver would get that piece of information, put it back together again and deliver it and give it to the, the end user. Um, that works really, really well in an internet environment and it's very resilient. The problem is with that system is, is that uh, when you get into video and audio, um, having signals come in out of order or having to be retransmitted um, and having lost packets, etc., become problematic. You can imagine doing a VoIP call, a uh, voice call over IP, and if you lose some packets, your, your voice quality becomes really choppy or 
garbled, etc. And I'm sure all of you have experienced that um, as we move more and more into VoIP. Um, similarly for video, video does not like having lost pieces of information because you can't recover necessarily from that. Um, if, we're do if we're downloading from YouTube or, or something like that, we don't really notice because everything is buffered. And what we get is we, we get the end result is a good quality um, video because it's taking care of all of the retransmissions and lost packets and we're just getting a clean feed. But in a live environment, live streaming or live video system, those become a real problem. So those are some of the real issues with TCP IP. So um, some of the challenges are uh, it was designed primarily for um, for a multi-user environment. That's really its nature. It was also designed for um, no, no automatic separation of data. You can't say these five computers are separate from these five systems. Um, there are ways around all of these things, but they're not built into TCP IP by itself. There is no automatic bandwidth control. Um, there's no way of saying this customer has you know, one meg and this one has five. Um, there's au no automatic quality of service feature that says you know, certain pieces of information get, the, get priority over other pieces of information. And there's no automatic encryption. That's just not part of it. Now again, all of these can be um, achieved using other means, but they're not built into C TCP IP. Now there is something called version 6. We're currently at IP TCP IP version 4. Um, it, if you're wondering what happened to 1, 2, 3, those just were never um, publicly available. So we are with version 4. Um, and it's been around for a long, long, long time. There is also a new, and I say new, uh, version called IP version 6. And it has a lot of brand new features. Um, it's been out there technically for about 20 years. <laughs> so it's not really new, but it hasn't been implemented. And the reason for that is it's not directly compatible with IP version 4, and people have been hesitating. We're in a spot right now where we are being forced into IP version 6 because IP version 4 is running out of room. It's called um, address spacing, and we just don't have any more addresses. So people are being forced to move to IP version 6 and we will eventually get to version 6. So there are some benefits, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, it's got built-in quality of service, it's got automatic encryption, um, faster protocol, and it has less need to separate the data because of the way it works. So those are some of the things that you just need to be aware of. Now, um, as we start talking about um, um, the um, uh, Ethernet and then different cabling system switches. Let's just take a look at that. So Ethernet cabling, um, we, I, I use the term Ethernet because 95% of you are going to be using Ethernet cabling. Um, some of you are going to use fiber, some of you are going to be using other methods, um, some of you are going to do wireless, which we'll talk about next, next time. Um, but primarily you're going to be using Ethernet. So there are um, uh, some standards out there that you just have to be aware of. So CAT5 by itself, which everybody throws that term around, is actually a fairly old cable. It stopped being manufactured in 2001. Um, and uh, some of you may still have it in your offices, etc. So you need to double check what that is. Technically, according to the standard, it does support gigabit speeds, but it's very rarely used in gigabit speeds because there are some issues with distance interference, etc. So typically when we talk about CAT5, we talk about 10 meg or 100 meg. Um, we, uh, we're, we're primarily using CAT5E, CAT6, CAT6A, and there's a new standard called CAT7, which I won't even go into. Um, Cat5e is one of the is the what is most popular, um, and a lot of people ask, well, should I go with Cat5e or should I go Cat6? So here's the the lowdown on it. Cat5e is uh, can go 100 meters, 328 feet, and it can go up to gigabit speeds, and you can purchase it in shielded or unshielded. Now, all of these cables can be purchased in shielded or unshielded. What does that mean? Shielding means that there's a foil wrapper on the cable, and that wrap basically protects it from interference sources. That can be external interference sources like motors, um, 
uh, in you know um, fluorescent lights, different other sources, high energy sources that can cause problems with with the data inside the cable. Um, as you move into higher speeds, the more susceptible they are. The other thing is is that the cables can actually interfere with each other. Um, and again, this is not really an issue in Cat 5e, but in you get into Cat 6 or Cat 7 when you're starting to transmit into 10 gig. Um, you have to be very careful because the cables can literally interfere with each other because they're so close to each other. Um, so that's where shielding really becomes um, important. So long and short of it, in your house, in your small business, most of you are going to be using unshielded um, cable. And that, that's fine. They work very well. However, if you are in an environment, an industrial environment, where there's a lot of potential um, high energy sources, motors, all kinds of other stuff, it is advised to use shielded cable. S some of you, and the reason I say this is because some of you are going to be doing video um, streaming at different events. You're going to be in arenas, you're going to be in um, stadiums, those sort of things. And you're going to be running Cat5 cable. And a lot of times you don't know what your environment is going to be. You might have a cable that's running right past an electrical room with big motors and pumps and everything else, and all of a sudden you're picking up interference off of that and your, ca your cabling is not working properly. So if you're in an industrial environment or if you're doing those kind of events, you may want to consider using shielded cable. So Cat5-6 um, was the first cable that came out. It is up to um, 10 gig, but it's got limited distance. Um, you can do 1 gig at um, 328 feet or 100 meters and 10 gig up to about 33 to 55 meters, somewhere up to about 180 feet. You need to be careful with it. CAT6 is just a little bit better. It's got some other th features to it and it's really good up to 10 gig and it's um, um, up to the full 200 and um, 200 or 328 feet. But again, you've got to be really careful with CAT6A cable. Um, even though you can run it in unshielded, strongly recommended because of um, that interference by itself. If you have a bundle of cables, strongly recommended that you use shielded cable um, in that bundle. Otherwise, you'll just have all kinds of issues if you're trying to run it at, at 10 gig speeds. Okay, um, the next real topic that we need to talk about is switches. And uh, in switches, there are a variety of different switches that you need to consider buying. One of them is just obviously a basic switch. It's a basic gigabit switch. We won't even talk really about 10 meg switches or 100 meg switches anymore. Um, but it is unmanaged. You just basically turn it on, plug in your devices, and away you go. Um, they're priced anywhere from, I've seen switches for $20 now all the way up to thousands of dollars. So what's the difference? Um, you gotta be careful because the low-end switches um, also have limited processing power. So they might only have you know four or five ports, but if you have lots of NDI equipment coming into it, that switch, just because of the hardware inside of it, you literally might run into problems where that the board can't process all of that information fast enough. Even though they call it a gigabit switch, switch it just doesn't have the capability of handling that much data. Um, so it's one of the, the old adages, you pay for what you get. Um, and uh, so I would recommend you kind of stay away from the real low end price stuff unless you're not doing that much data or you've read the specs and you're satisfied with what the capability of that particular device. The next level is really a basic with PoE. Um, we're moving more and more into PoE devices. Anytime you're running Cat5, you can send power over that device. So. Um, there are two standards, 802.3AF and AT. Um, AT is higher power, well, it's the same power, but higher wattage, and AF is lower wattage. So you really need to know what kind of devices you're powering and make sure that you buy the appropriate PoE. Now, one thing I will warn you about PoE is, is that switches will often say that they're PoE, but they have a wattage limit. So for example, they might say, this is an eight port switch with PoE, and it has 30 watts maximum capability. Well, what does that mean? It means that you can put a PoE out of any port, but total wattage out is 15 watts. Therefore, if you had two devices of 15 watts apiece, you could actually only do two ports. The third port wouldn't work because you wouldn't have enough power going out. 
So there's a lot of manufacturers that you have to be very, very careful what they mean by PoE. Um, they'll always look at the maximum wattage out to kind of figure out how many devices you can actually power with PoE. The third level is really a called a managed switch or a smart switch and that gives you the ability to not only um, plug your devices in but then you can also go in and set things up such as VLANs, quality of service, take a look at monitoring and all kinds of things like that. And they're not that much more than basic switches so I would recommend that you consider that. And then of course you could have managed uh, switches with PoE. So let's very look briefly at this. If you had an unmanaged switch, um, it would be one single network. Every single device that you plug into this would, would basically be on the same network as everyone else. And if there was contention issues or throughput issues, etc., you would run into problems. Um, a managed switch allows you to literally break the switch up into multiple networks. Um, so if I had VLAN 100, I could put all my NDI cameras on that. If I had VLAN 200, I could put all my other AV equipment, uh, lighting, whatever else, into that port. And the two would be completely separate. The data would be completely isolated. They wouldn't hear each other, etc. And you could also have maybe another VLAN strictly for the office people, um, HR, um, manufacturing, whatever the case may be. And then it wouldn't interfere with your um, NDI equipment. And then the final thing with VLANs is you can actually also make ports that belong to multiple VLANs. So in this case, these end ports here belong to VLAN 100 and 200. So uh, you get a lot of flexibility with a managed port. You can also add quality of service rules if you needed to. And if you had PoE, you can manage all of that and do all of your monitoring. Now you might say, well, that's a very high level topic. Why would I ever need that? Um, that's way beyond me. It is and it isn't. Let me give you a very um, practical example. Um, uh, the church that I go to, we use vMix. Um, I do all of the vMix stuff. I've got NDI running into it um, from one, of the, one or two of the computers. Um, I also do multicast um, video to a number of projectors and TVs throughout the building. And also the audio guys are plugged into it because they're using an, a Roland audio system that does Cat5 for all of the, um, um, all of the pickups, etc. So I thought that I would buy a managed gigabit switch for use in that, and I didn't put any VLANs in. So I hooked up everybody. I put in the multi, uh, multicast uh, projectors, I put in the NDI, I put in vMix, and I hooked up the audio, I turned it on, and the audio guys completely blew up. Everything did not work for them. And it was because the multicast projectors, the signal that was going out, was actually interfering with the audio system. Now, I could have bought a separate switch for the, for the audio, but what I did is I created a VLAN specifically for the audio, and I gave them ports 22, 23, 24, and they were completely happy. Their, their traffic was completely isolated. And I gave another block to the, um, to the multicast to the projectors. And that data was not shared with anybody else. Nobody else saw it. And then I had another VLAN for the regular vMix and NDI cameras, et cetera. And then I isolated out uh, some other computers as well. So that one switch cost me one switch as opposed to buying three or four to do exactly the same thing. So there's less of versatility. It is a complicated topic, but it's something that's really important. Um, finally, I just want to talk about requirements. Um, NDI requirements requires about 100 meg per channel. Um, so if you were to take an old switch, a 10100 switch, and you had one NDI camera hooked up to vMix, um, everything would, would work fine, right? Because you have 100 meg in, and you've got 100 meg out to your computer, everything is good. As soon as you plugged in another NDI, all of a sudden, yes, the NDI cameras are sending 100 meg to the switch, and both of them are, but now you're trying to pull 200 meg out of one port to, a, to your vMix, and all of a sudden, things don't work anymore, they break. If you plugged in a gigabit switch, that would solve your problem. Um, so those are some of the things that you just have to watch. And again, it's not as simple as just saying a gigabit switch or a, you know, a big powerful switch is gonna solve everything. Because again, if you've got lots of plug people plugged in with laptops and other devices, um, remember that it's not just about speed. 
Um, it's also about contention. You've got lots of people competing for resources and you really have to think about um, other things. So I just want to do a uh, quick summary. So um, you want to make sure that when you're thinking about this, you want to make sure that you use a gigabit um, infrastructure. Um, even if you want to you know, think about future growth, about a 10 gig, you can think about that as well, but gigabit for sure. Second of all, you want to make sure that you buy quality equipment. Um, that's just a must and, um, you know, within budget constraints, of course, but it's really, uh, you pay for what you get. Um, the other one, you also want to make sure that you invest in your cabling. If you have poor cables, even if you buy Cat6 cables, but if you don't make the ends properly, uh, if you put on poor ends, uh, poor connectors, you bend your cables, things like that, that can cause nothing but problems on your system. So make sure that you invest in and making good quality of cables and, and um, making sure that they don't get pinched or run over and all of those kind of things. Um, consider using PoE. Um, this really, really helps, especially with NDI, because you're running a Cat5 cable already. If you use PoE, you can power those, um, those cameras, those um, bird dog devices or whatever else with PoE, and then you don't have to have all of these additional cables um, for power and power plugs and all the rest of it. So it's, it's a good investment to con consider, but make sure you understand what you're buying before you uh, just buy any old PoE switch. You also want to make sure that you um, want to control your traffic. And we talked about VLANs, et cetera, separating your data. If, you have a, if, you, if you're a small um, uh, person that's streaming and you know all of the equipment in your in your house or your office, then maybe this isn't really important. But as soon as you get into a lot more complicated systems, traffic control is a big issue. Um, use managed switches if you can, if you can afford them, strongly recommended. Um, add VLANs as necessary, add quality of service if that's what, what is needed as well. And make sure that you monitor traffic and check to see everything that is, is working properly. So um, as we um, as we wrap up today, um, just want to thank you again for watching. Next week, we're, or next time we do the show, we're going to talk about TCP, um, video over TCP, specifically in a wireless infrastructure. And um, that is a whole new topic. And uh, so we're just going to um, wrap up today, and uh, we'll see you next time. Take care.